Hey, it's Joe. I'm talking to my friend Tiffany, who just had a what? Tracheostomy. It was actually in 2017, so three years ago. Okay, so that involves removing the trachea? No, they just punch a hunk of plastic into your neck. That's the scar. Uh -huh. And there's about a two inch long curved metal pipe that goes down into your trachea. Okay. And you breathe through the hole. You just literally have a chunk of plastic keeping an opening in your neck clear through to your trachea and you breathe through it. Okay, so your mouth and nose are no longer required for air? Exactly, although I didn't need it because my mouth and nose worked just fine after they laparoscopically removed the scar tissue. But their concern was they had to do three, uh, three rounds of laparoscopic surgery. And because the first surgery, the breathing tube had caused me to stop breathing, they just, the surgeon just, I mean, I don't like to think badly of surgeons, but I feel like he just felt it was more convenient for him. And that really sucked for me. So I was stuck with a hunk of plastic in my throat for three months needlessly. Okay, I'm sorry, five months. One yeah, day, and it's it's Tiffany, a it's the way back. One day Tiffany's walking down the street when all of a sudden, what did she feel? What happened? How old was she? Um, I was so in 2017 I was 39 and I had been suffering from this condition noticeably for five years. This condition being subglottic idiopathic subglottic stenosis. Which just means that yeah. your trachea is being cut off by scar tissue and no one knows why. Okay, so this condition is extremely rare. Out. Yeah, it. so your your trachea but is I the size of a quarter. On an artery? Um, no, they're cutting the scar tissue out of your trachea. No, I understand, but should I think of the accumulation of the scar tissue similar to plaque accumulating on an artery wall? Yes, yes. That's, that's a good I don't know why this happens. They don't. In fact, there's a related condition called um, tracheal stenosis, which is what I was diagnosed with in 2017. Mm -hmm. um, but tracheal stenosis is only caused by two things, long-term intubation or autoimmune disease. I don't have either one. So all along, it was like there was no information. I used JSTOR through my school to research medical journals scientific journals, try to find anything I could. No one had any information. There was nobody like me. And uh, uh, so because of that, they didn't know the cause. And my care was subpar because I didn't have insurance. And uh, so when I finally got a good doctor and went to Salt Lake, they told me I'd been misdiagnosed, they're a research hospital. And they're like, what you actually have is this. And while, again, no one knows the cause, no one knows, it's the Karen disease, that's my new name for it. Because it only appears right now in white women between 31 and 45 years of age. Let me understand the, the stenosis thing you said, but had lots of syllables was the correct or the incorrect diagnosis? Tracheal stenosis was the incorrect diagnosis because I had never been long-term intubated and I didn't have autoimmune. Instead, you really had? Idiopathic subglottic stenosis. Okay, well, somebody got the stenosis part right. Yeah, stenosis is the scar tissue. Yeah. You can have start stenosis in any part of your body. Okay. So. So they, is it that they thought the stenosis was in a different part of your body? No, you just can have stenosis anywhere. Some people have stenosis no, in their wrist. The first one was trachea. <laughs> yeah, it in is in my trachea. <laughs> the other one you was- You were correct <laughs> about that, but tracheal stenosis <laughs> as a diagnosis is in and of itself saying that you either have autoimmune or you were long-term intubated. Which are not true. So the right. one you have is what? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. There, there are just too many syllables for me to keep straight in my head. The yeah. correct stenosis you have is? Idiopathic, which means they don't know the cause. Okay. Subglottic, which means it's below your vocal cords. 
Okay. And but that's the other your, difference. Yeah. Tracheal stenosis tends to be higher. Okay. Subglottic is below your vocal cords. Okay. Above or below the vocal cord? Yeah, below for subglottic. Subglottic. Uh, Appreciate it. Yeah. So by the time they caught it in 2017, after being told for three and a half years that I had asthma and was fat, and also having it implied to me by several doctors that I must be lying about having never smoked, um, they, I, I, I had been to so many doctors and I always said, it's right here and it feels like I'm breathing through a straw. No one ever put a stethoscope against my throat. Finally, in 2017, I couldn't breathe. And I went to a doctor and I said, I will not leave this chair until someone tells me what is wrong with me. And I put my hands around the bottom of the chair and I said, see, I'm not going. Because I was done <laughs> and I couldn't camp anymore. That was like the final insult. Like it, the condition had taken everything from me and it had gotten to where I couldn't go camping because I couldn't breathe well enough at a higher elevation to function. And this day, there happened to be a specialist at the clinic and he came in and he put a stethoscope on my throat right here where I told him to and said, your airway's obstructed. And I said, no dip, thanks. Can we please figure out why? So he got me in for a CAT scan and a scope and they discovered that I had less than 5% of an airway. So that means instead of a quarter size, I was breathing through an aperture about that big which is why I flatlined in the table when they put the breathing tube down me, which is why they gave me the emergency tra tracheostomy that was never supposed to happen. Three okay. surgeries later, I was supposedly back to about 90% of an airway. Gave me a whole new lease on life. It was fantastic. But the condition is inherently um, self-triggering because when you cut scar tissue, it activates it. And that's the problem with this condition is it tends to accelerate rather than be taken care of by laparoscopic surgery. You said that it typically affects 31 to 45. When you're white 40, women. Are we better or is this now because you got it in that period for the rest of your life? No, it's just that the oldest, the limit, the age limit so far is 45, but of course these women are aging just like me. In five years, the limit will be 50. Does that make sense? No one younger than 31 has gotten it. And no one older than 45 has gotten it. But once you've gotten it, yeah. it's part of your life condition? Yes. Okay. And it's uh, because of this narrow age limit, it is a very um, a new thing. There, there, there hasn't been much research because we're talking about you know, a, a decade of research. Um, and only one in half a million people have it. And uh, there is 2% roughly of the people who have it that are outliers. But speaking of the research that's been done, the bulk of it is white women, 31 to 45. And uh, <clears throat> my theory is that there's some kind of contaminant that we as white women in particular were exposed to when we were young probably a beauty product and they're probably going to figure that out and it probably is a thing where it takes down your immune support in some way and makes you susceptible to the bacteria which causes it and the bacteria which causes it is similar to tuberculosis but it is not tuberculosis and that is as far as the research has gotten but they are doing research and they have developed what's called the Mayo Protocol at Mayo Clinic for how to live with it, how to manage it which is extremely empowering. Just got this information two weeks ago. Very happy about this. Um, it's already things that I was doing, like staying off gluten, you know, and, and living on an anti-inflammatory diet. Um, but there's also this new technique they're doing, which is treating it with steroids, with steroid injections. And they're having good results. It's fairly a new thing. Um, and that's what I'm doing now. They had to do another surgery because I'd gotten so bad again that, you know, it was too late. So we did another surgery. They stuck me with a bunch of steroids. So, yep. That's that's it. Oh, I'm sorry. You're that's asking that. questions about something that I'm very interested in oh, no, because no, no, it's no, personal. No. 
And we don't have to talk about this one. No, I'm, 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 given my work. There we yeah. Go. Yeah. I'm just trying to, I'm trying to be somewhat linear about it. I want to track something you said in your story. I'm terrible about linear. In 2016, you were just fat and whatever is what they said. You must have yeah. seen your fat up until 2017 when you put your hands around the chair instead of yeah. Okay. Yeah, it was 2013 was when I first okay. went to see yeah. a doctor. You told me that first you were diagnosed with tracheal stenosis. Well, first I was misdiagnosed as having asthma. Okay, but what was the period of time between the tracheal and the video? Three years. 2017, they diagnosed me with tracheal stenosis. Okay, so when you put your hands on the chair and said, I'm not leaving, and they took care of you and you flatlined, they were that, treating your tracheal stenosis, which you did not have. Correct. Okay. Yeah. And, and then that, last month, I finally had a doctor say, that's not what you have. Okay. You have subglot idiopathic subglottic stenosis. Okay. So in 2017, you had an operation for tracheal stenosis. Mm -hmm. which tried to clear scar tissue above your yeah. vocal cord, which did not exist. Well, I mean, they could see where it was. Why they never, apparently the surgeon literally doesn't know about idiopathic subglottic stenosis. And tracheal stenosis was the closest diagnosis he could come up with because it's clearly below my glottis. Like, I mean, they knew that, but. Okay, so um, would you say that the 2017 operation was ineffective, largely ineffective? No, because it ineffective? saved my life. I had two months or less to live at that point, probably more like one. And uh, it the problem area, they cleared something else that was not such a problem area. And that no, was they, they took care of, so the way I understand it, and I could be Yep. incorrect about this but it's a pipe right mm -hmm. and they cleared the where the most of it was mm -hmm. at some and they did three surgeries bam 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 uh august 2017 october 2017 january 2018 okay. and at the end of those three surgeries my surgeon said you're back to 90 percent of an airway we're gonna leave it and see how it goes it was absolutely life-saving, I would have died. Now let me and ask also, you, you did it in three waves because it was- So invasive and so- uh, You couldn't be under anesthesia that long or, you know- I, You know, I'd have to ask the surgeon, but his reason was that it is too drastic to do it all at once when it's that bad. So in and essence, so it was the same operation three times. Three times. He the first time got me to back to about fifty percent of an airway. Second time I was back to like sixty-five. Third time ninety. Um, it was, you know, the difference between not breathing and breathing is like completely like, life-altering. Yeah, it's it's a, insane. So then, three years pass. No, one year. So okay. last year, 2019, it got bad again. They did another surgery. Um, they sure. said at that time, I was down to about 60% of an airway. I could still tell a big difference. Um, so that was good until December. And that's the, the acceleration part. So after surgery three, I was able to go a year and a half before it got back down to 60%. Okay, so we're in about 2019. It, that was that was in July 2019, almost exactly July a year ago. You had another operation for your trachea. Yeah, and that and was this December, last surgery last week. So what happened last week? Yeah. Oh, okay. Because in July 2019, you left the hospital with a piece of plastic? No, that was 2017. So 2017 is when they put a trachea tracheostomy and so put a trach in me. Have an external breathing tube for, for five years. months from August 2017 until January 2018. Okay, at which point they removed that. Yeah, because I didn't need it. And they Sorry. restored it's, your... Okay. Yeah, 
And then a year later it had grown back and I was down to about 60% of an airway again and then they did, did another surgery. Which was the equivalent of a third of the original surgery or it wasn't yes. so bad? Yeah, ish, ish. Okay. So then and then happened? one year later, this past month, I'm down to 20% again. Okay. Or less, which means it accelerated quite a bit. The grow back was quite fast. The surgeon this time told me that it was growing in a corkscrew this time. Who knows how long that's been happening? I have an inkling that it probably was there before and just wasn't caught. And the reason I think that is because the longest the other surgeon ever spent on me in surgery was 40 minutes. These three surgeons in Salt Lake spent almost three hours working on me. And obviously they took more time to make sure they got everything. And I could tell from the level of swelling, <laughs> the two days after surgery were bad. And you, you know, days ago, 10? What? How many days ago were you operated on for three hours? Uh, last Tuesday. So, yeah, yeah. So um, I'm, I mean, oxygen is just magic. It is literally magic. So yeah, I, and, and a week ago, I couldn't you expect you're going to have another operation in the middle of next year. So hopefully not the new treatments with the steroid injections that I'm going down to Salt Lake for once a month now, uh, hopefully will be really effective. And I'm being a lot more strict about my diet. And now that I can breathe, I can get back in shape, which always happens after surgery. I immediately start dropping weight the moment I can breathe again. It's your body conserves. Um, I'm, gen I'm normally a very like ADD person <laughs> and I move a lot. And when I can't breathe, when it gets bad, your body just stops you and you don't even realize it. But every moment, every movement is efficient. You don't make even a hand gesture. You don't have to wow. just automatically because your body's like, we can't. You know, and so I always, I always gain weight. What? When you got, when you were 20%, was it safe to operate a motor vehicle? Uh, it was getting unsafe. Sure it was getting unsafe. So the week, to about two weeks leading up to surgery this past month, I began running red lights and stopping at green ones. And a lot. And uh, it was, I was like, yeah, I think I'm worse than they think. And I was, I was, they had said 25%. It was more, it was less than 20. And I can tell, I, you know, I just can tell my short term memory goes, I can't respond and react properly. I get muddled my, and a lot of it is sleep. If you've ever had sleep apnea, um, or known anyone who did, the constant interruption in REM sleep, yeah, yeah. you know, they use it as a torture tactic. It makes people crazy. It breaks your brain. Mm -hmm. So I, a lot of it is just, I get to a point where I'm not sleeping. You know, I'm asleep, but I'm not really asleep. And you do that for enough days consecutively and you get really weird. Without your permission, I'm showing this to no one, but my audience would find this fascinating. I would love for you to show it. I passionately, fiercely want to advocate for people like me and get, not just with this condition, but so many conditions where people, and I, I know it's not across the board, but women don't get listened to. They don't get listened to. And part of it is because they don't trust themselves enough to say, I know what's wrong with me. Take care of me. And I had to fight so hard to live. And I feel like that experience could really be used for someone else. I mean, if, if there was a way that I could use the hell I've been through to empower somebody else to get help, Oh my God, I would be like my, my biggest dreams coming true. I, I don't know how to do it. I'm not a social media person. You know, I'm not a tech person. I don't know how to do it. I know. What they're doing. Yeah, that would be fantastic. Like, I, I just, yeah. Um, that 
and your insurance was poor. Have you had these last years for what must be hundreds of thousands, not Yeah, I'm in terrible medical debt that I, you know, I'll just pay it when I can pay it or die with it, you know, because the crazy thing, the crazy thing about this is it kills you. It is literally a terminal condition but it is not considered a disability in the United States. It is not a disability. You cannot get disability for it. You can get a disability for having a trach long-term, but because I only had it for five months, they wouldn't give me disability. I didn't want disability. I want to work. I want to be a productive member of society. All I wanted was help being well, and we can't get that in this country like the just the astronomical stupidity of that and the fact that it almost killed me makes me really really angry and makes me really want to change something Idaho had a Medicaid expansion at the beginning of the end of last year I didn't think I'd qualify I tried three times to qualify to get help for this I have sat in a billing office, weeping, trying to express that I think I deserve to live, even though I can't pay for a surgery. I don't think anyone should have to do that. And it makes me very angry. And since I've talked to people about what I went through, I found out that I'm obviously very, very common story. I have a friend whose mother died of cancer for the same reason. Um, and it's not right, and it's not okay. Um, I don't think anyone who can't breathe should have to beg for their life. And uh, I did. Um, the Medicaid expansion, I decided to try one more time, and I qualified. And that is the only reason I was able to change doctors and advocate and push to get the care I need. And the only reason I am able to go to Salt Lake to the University of Utah Research Hospital. And the only reason that maybe this won't kill me by the time I'm 50, which it just shouldn't be this hard. Um, I lost my insurance because I divorced to leave an abusive marriage. And I was in such poor health that I couldn't ever quite work full time and go to school full time although I did an incredible job with what I had to work with. And the perception in society that people like me deserve it and that we're poor because of something that we did is crappy and it doesn't matter anyway. But I know from my experience, because I was an affluent white woman married to a high wage earner for 16 years, and I saw how my health was handled then and after, and it is night and day. And I am the same person. I am the same articulate, intelligent, strong person. And I'm white. And yet I was treated terribly once I was poor, once I didn't have insurance. And I know that if that's my story, the story of people who are immigrants, people of color, people who don't speak English as their first language has to be that much worse. And I just, I, if I could use my voice in any way, literally my voice, because it took my voice away. So I would, I would love that. If there is anything I can do that you could help me with, I would love for you to let me know. You just <laughs> I just, um, I know what ha you have to do. Like, I, I also know that I could help, I could help people in my situation with what they have to do like throwing a tantrum like a four-year-old child and holding onto the bottom of a chair and saying, I'm not leaving your office because sometimes that's what it takes. And like telling someone in a billing office who is telling you you're a bad human being because you can't pay your medical bills. I don't think that it's fair for you to say that to me when I just want to live. And I just think that it'd be awesome to be able to help people <laughs> be able to do that. So learn from my, my battle, 
but unfortunately, one of the worst things about this kind of situation is that you are alone. Um, people in my situation, if they weren't alone, it wouldn't be so bad. But they don't know anybody who's going through it and they don't know anyone who can help them. And they don't have money to find a lawyer. <laughs> it's just a bad deal.